And dear loving Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this beautiful Sabbath day. Lord, we're thankful for the blessings you give us each day of the week, for your great mercy and your love and your forgiveness. We're especially thankful for the Sabbath, Lord. And as we come in your house on this holy Sabbath day to worship you, Lord, we ask that you will accept our worship. May the angels come and fill every empty seat, and may we know that we are worshiping in your very presence. Send the Holy Spirit to be here in each heart, in each mind. Fill us with your presence, Lord. And throughout this service, my prayer is that Jesus Christ will be glorified here today. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. To many who call themselves Christians, there's a feeling about Christianity like the man felt about his headache. He sure as the world didn't want to lose his head, but there wasn't very much pleasure in keeping it either. Now most of us surely would not want to lose our Christian experience, and yet if we were to really face the facts today, perhaps many of us at least would have to admit that we don't get a great deal of pleasure out of it either. Really now, has your Christian experience made you noticeably happier? And I hope I don't sound a little anti-church here. I surely don't mean to, but frankly, I don't notice that people come swarming to the Seventh-day Adventist Church to find out why we are so much happier than the rest of the world. In fact, are folks standing in the aisles of any Christian church begging to find out why it is that they are so much happier? After all, happiness is not the thing that occupies the interest exclusively of Christians or of Adventists. That's what everybody's after. And if we've got it, the world will want it. Has anybody come to your home and asked you, could you give me a little bit of the secret as to why your home is so happy? There was a knock on the missionary's door and there stood a lady who said, please, I'd like to become a Christian. Wonderful, said the missionary. Have you been studying with someone? No. Have you read the Bible? No, begging your pardon, sir, but I have never read the words of your book. But I have heard the laughter in your house. You see, many of us feel that we have a good Christian experience, but we don't enjoy a good Christian experience. With the psalmist, it was not that way. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Psalm 40, the 40th Psalm. Psalm 40, and the eighth verse. Psalm 40, verse 8. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Haven't you always wanted to come to the place in your Christian experience where doing right is the greatest delight of your life? There are many of us who are endeavoring to do right because we're supposed to. Because we know we ought to. Because it's the thing to do. Because it's a good thing to do. And we mean to be good people. But wouldn't it be wonderful to come to the place where doing good and being good is the greatest fun, the greatest joy of living? That's where David apparently was in his experience as he wrote this psalm. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Psalm 16, 11, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And then again in Psalm 122, 1, David says, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. How did David get to that place in his experience? Here's our theme this morning. 
The happy Christian is the one who has found not only something to believe in, but someone to love. Oh, dear fellow Seventh-day Adventist Christians, the true Christian is the one who has found not only something to believe in, but someone to love. Do you want to be an overcoming Christian? Then we must first of all learn to be loving Christians. Now folks, there has always been in Adventism a built-in temptation to legalism. After all, it's pretty hard if a man doesn't drink coffee or alcohol or suck cigarettes and eat pig to keep from thinking that he's a little superior to people who aren't quite so careful. And it's a little hard if he does pay tithe and if he does keep the Sabbath to keep from thinking that somehow these are going to recommend him to heaven. During the late 1800s, the Seventh-day Adventist Church was at a low ebb. Sister White said, our preaching and our experience has become as dry as the hills of Gilboa. Now here's your quick geography lesson for the day. Gilboa means bubbling fountain. So it must have been named because there were streams, there was plenty of moisture there. But Gilboa was cursed by David when Saul and Jonathan died there in battle. And their bodies were desecrated there by the Philistines. You find that story at the end of 1 Samuel and the beginning of 2 Samuel. The hills of Gilboa are just north of the Dead Sea in the Judean desert. And even in the spring, the hills of Gilboa are brown because up there it never rains. Our preaching and our experience has become as dry as the hills of Gilboa. And then came the General Conference Session of 1888, Minneapolis, Minnesota, October 17th. 78 delegates present. And the pre-session was devoted especially to the study of two young fellows that blew in out of the West. One of those two was E.J. Wagner, Short, stocky, studious, cocky, bandy rooster sort of a fellow. And his partner was A.T. Jones, slim, tall, angular, Lincoln-esque, self-educated, strongly opinionated. And their message, salvation is by faith alone. Elder Butler, president of the General Conference, was not present because of illness, and when the studies have been pretty well completed, old brother Uriah Smith stood up in the congregation, quiet, unassuming, part of the old guard, highly respected, editor of the Adventist Review, the Review and Herald back then. I would like to thank our young brethren, said Uriah Smith, for leading us into the study on righteousness by faith. But we must all understand, said Uriah Smith, that Adventists have always believed in righteousness by faith. Salvation is by faith plus works. A man can never work his way to heaven, but he's got to go as high as he can, and Christ will make up the difference. A man has got to progress as far as possible before he turns all the rest over to the Lord. And right then, Wagner was on his feet. He said, we can do nothing until first everything has been turned over to the Lord. Uriah Smith was back on his feet. Let's stay by the landmarks, brethren. And Wagner was on his feet. Let's follow this new truth. There was a photograph taken and everybody looks mad. Well, now who's right? Whatever is righteousness by faith? I'd like us to answer that question in three parts this morning. And as we do, we're going to find the secret to becoming happy, overcoming Christians. Three parts. Number one. Only Christ's righteousness is sufficient to ever get us to heaven. Did you know that the requirement for heaven is perfect obedience? There's no sin in heaven. Did you know that? 
The requirement for heaven is perfect obedience. Therefore, it has to be Christ's obedience because our obedience could never be perfect. Turn in your Bible now to the book of Romans. Romans, the fifth chapter. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin sin entered into the world, and who is that? It's Adam. And death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Then down to verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience, Adam again, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. How then are we made righteous? By the obedience of one. And who is that one? Jesus Christ. Even if somehow you could manage to become as perfect as necessary for heaven, it would be impossible for you to do so without becoming proud of it. And when you became proud of it, you'd be a sinner again. Because sinner... Sin is pride. Sin is self-centeredness. Sin is having wrong thoughts and wrong motives, not just wrong words and wrong actions. Brethren and sisters, we are not saved by our obedience. We are not saved by being commandment keepers. We are not saved by being vegetarians. The Holy Spirit does not come in a can from Loma Linda. Perfect obedience is required for heaven, but it's Christ's obedience. It's not ours. That's step one. Then what I need is Christ's perfection. It's the only way to ever become good enough for heaven. I've got to have Christ's perfection. Now how do I get it? That's number two. Christ's righteousness becomes mine in only one way. And that is through faith. Please turn back just a bit to Romans, the fourth chapter, verses five and six of Romans four. Romans four, beginning with verse five. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness. That word imputeth simply means to credit something to another. So because Christ died, because Christ lived the perfect life, he imputes that. He credits us with the results of of his obedience and his death. Imputeth righteousness without, what's the next word? without works. Then the moment we accept Christ before we have done anything but accept, we are declared immediately righteous and Brother Wagoner was right. You see, Christ accepts us not because of what we are, but because of what he is. Christ accepts me not because I am good, but because he is good. And if I ever get mixed up with the idea that he accepts me on the basis of my goodness, what reason am I ever going to have to be convinced of his goodness? All right, it's Christ's perfection that we need. It becomes ours by faith when we simply reach out and accept it. Now, it's only natural for us to love people that treat us so much better than we deserve. When I come to Jesus, an undeserving, filthy sinner, and he accepts me just the way I am, then I fall in love with Jesus. Reminds me of a story about a father and his son, Jim. Jim, please mow the lawn. All they keep me around here for is to mow the lawn. Mow the lawn, mow the lawn. I never get a chance to do anything I want to do all the time. It's mow the lawn, Jim, mow the lawn. Jim starts up the lawnmower. 
takes a shortcut across mother's flower bed. Misses all the trees by a good couple of feet on each side, grumbling all the while. Several days go by and Jim is out driving the family car when he doesn't have any business driving it and there's an accident. And he doesn't have a license. He becomes frightened and he panics and he steps on the accelerator instead of the brake and now it's hit and run. And they arrest him and they lock him up. And he calls dad. And dad and mother come. It's true in every state. There's a paper prepared where they sign their names guaranteeing their support, which makes Jim a free man. Jim, please mow the lawn. And that lawn never had such a fine mowing during all the years of its existence. Whatever has happened, it's the same boy. It's the same dad. It's the same lawn. There's a different relationship there now. So you see, it's Christ's perfection that we need. We receive Christ's righteousness through faith before we have done anything to deserve it and that makes our hearts respond to such undeserved acceptance and love i delight to do thy will O oh my god yea thy law is within my heart obedience then is from love that leads us to step three Works, you see, are the result and not the cause of salvation. Why are we saved? Because of Jesus, only Jesus. Why the works? Because of the salvation provided by Jesus, because of our growing relationship with Jesus. Galatians, the fifth chapter, we won't take the time to turn to it because you know the text very well, Galatians chapter 5. We have the fruits of the Spirit, verses 22 and 23 of Galatians 5, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. What are these again? These are called the fruits of the Spirit. A number of years ago, I ordered a couple of bare root cherry trees from a mail order company. And I was so excited when they arrived. And they were very nice trees, nice branching, excellent root system, very healthy trees. I was pleased with my purchase. But you know, as I examined those trees closer, I hunted high and low on those trees when I opened the package, and you know, there wasn't a bit of fruit on either of them, not a single cherry. Now, I had some options open. I could have leaned those trees against the side of the house and gone down to Safeway, fries, bought some cherries, scotch taped them on the tree. I'd have had cherry trees, fruit and all. But it wouldn't have lasted very long. And that fruit would have dried up very soon or the birds would have eaten them, which is typically what they do with my cherries anyhow. Now, when does a fruit tree bear fruit? Before you plant it or after? First, you plant the tree, and the trouble with a lot of our Christian experiences is that we are trying to get fruit on the branches when we haven't yet planted the tree. Oh, brother, sister, let your roots go down deep into the soil of Jesus' love, and the fruit will come without any conniving. You see, with this kind of Christian experience, Christianity is not a matter of having to. It is Christ's intention that Christianity, that it should always be positive, and we have so many times made it negative. I have to do this. Oh, I have to do that. We have presumed that Christianity is a matter of stamping out sin, and stamping out sin, and here is my heart, and I find myself a black, ugly sin, and I go to work on it, and I work on it, and I stamp it, and I stamp it, and I stamp it, and when I finally think I've eradicated that sin, I'll move on to the next one, and I'll work on it, and I'll stamp it, and I'll stamp it. 
And if I should ever succeed in getting all the way around, you know what I've got left? I've got an empty heart. And Jesus said, when you have an empty heart, seven devils will come in to take the place of the one that was driven out. That's not Christianity. Christianity is not stamping out sin. It's crowding out sin. Christianity takes the human heart and begins to fill it with a love for Jesus. And day by day, there's a little more love. And the more love there is in my heart, the less room there is for sin. Until eventually my heart is so full of love, there is no place for sin to be. The goodness of Christianity is too often badness held in check. I won't, I won't, I will not commit that sin today. I won't, I won't. But you will, won't you? I won't swear, and maybe you'll even get the victory over swearing, and you'll take up criticism and gossip instead. Brethren and sisters, it is not Christian growth to overcome socially unacceptable sins and to replace them with sins that are socially acceptable. When our Christianity is based on a love relationship with Jesus Christ, it's a matter of want to, not have to, want to. Back to the psalmist again, our original text, Psalm 40 and verse 8. We come now to the place where we can begin to understand the psalmist when he says, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. I was lost and you saved me before I did anything to deserve it. I love you for that. I want to obey you all my life. Doing right becomes a delight because it has to do with more than something we believe in. It's based upon pleasing someone whom we love. Brethren and sisters, the characteristic of a true Christian disciple is not that he does good deeds, but that he has good motives. Stop listing all of the good things that you do. We're pretty good people, at least on the outside, at least compared to so many other people. But the strength of our Christian experience is not in the good deeds that we perform, but in the good motives that we possess. Jesus made that so clear in his Sermon on the Mount. Let's stop priding ourselves in what we do and start asking ourselves why we do it. Teenage boy. Mother all the time after him to comb his hair, to wash his face, to change his clothes, to mind his manners. All the time he seems to be a mess. And then he meets a girl. And all of a sudden, he becomes amazingly polished and courteous and tidy. He wants to because he's in love. And oh, if a Christian experience is based on a love affair with Jesus Christ, how easy, how enjoyable it is to live to please the one we love. We want to do different things. We want to act differently. We want to think different thoughts. We want to take every opportunity we can to be with that person whom we love. I want to slip in just a little something here on what sometimes we refer to as cheap grace. I get a bit disturbed about some of the things we hear in Christianity today about righteousness by faith. Some people say Christian experience, that's no sweat at all. All you have to do is have a relationship with Jesus. That's all it is. No work, just relationship. And I don't mind what they say so much, but it's a kind of a grin on their face as they're saying it, as though they found the solution to all of our spiritual problems because they infer that it's easy to have a relationship. Brethren and sisters, I submit to you that it's easier to do good deeds than it is to maintain in good relationships. Pretty much every religion in the world today, big or small, is based on doing good deeds. It's doing things to please the gods, to appease the gods. It's not based on having a relationship with a god. I submit to you that it's easier to do good deeds than it is to maintain a good relationship. 
And I think that's the reason so many of us have settled for doing good deeds because we tried building the relationship and we found that that's a little bit difficult. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes work. Tell me, which is easier, to stay married or to stay in love? Which is easier, to obey your boss or to love your boss? It's true that all we need is a relationship with Christ and the rest will happen, but don't dismiss a relationship as a matter of a shrug of the shoulders or a raise of the hand. Those of you that are married or have children could tell us that you don't maintain a good relationship unless you work at it. There's that word again, work. The work of the Christian is not to perform good deeds, but it's to fight, fight, fight continually for what Ellen White calls that vital union between ourselves and Christ. Paul, in his letter to Timothy, says, fight the good fight of faith. That's where the fight is. That's the work of the Christian, to fight for that union. You ever ride in one of those old streetcars? And sometimes it'll come to a junction or turn a corner too soon, too quickly, too sharply, and the trolley will jump the wire. And everything goes dead. That wire connecting the car to the source of power is broken. Everything goes dead. The lights go out. No power. It's not moving. Immediately, the conductor jumps out and goes to the back and starts to push, right? He wants to get that trolley moving again. Maybe if he could find a place to brace his feet. Maybe if he gave it all he had. Maybe if he got some of the strong guys to get out of the car and to help him push. Maybe he could push the streetcar a little ways. If it's downhill, he might get away with it. Maybe even on a level surface, he could make a little progress. But eventually, there comes an upward incline. We all of us want to keep our Christian experience moving down the road to heaven. Brethren, our business is not to push. And some of us have been pushing, trying to provide the power ourselves. And you can get away with it for a little while if things are going easy in your life. But then when things get tough and a wee bit uphill, there's no power. And we blame Christianity. Learn the lesson from the streetcar conductor. His immediate impulse is not to push it's to get back there and pull that cable around and regain that vital union between the car and the source of power. The work of the Christian is a maintaining of that vital union, our source of power, Jesus Christ. And so what does righteousness by faith mean? First, it means that God declares a man sinless the moment he accepts Christ. Secondly, being treated so much better than we deserve awakens within us at least the beginnings of our love relationship with Christ. And then finally, we serve him then as a result and not the cause of salvation. How to have an overcoming experience, how to enjoy your Christian experience. Oh, brethren and sisters, you must love Christ before you can love serving him. Housewife was married to a mean man. He actually made out a literal list. Rise, 6 a.m. Build a fire. Get my breakfast. Make my lunch. Clean the house. Do my laundry. This is what I want for supper tonight. Everything down through the whole day, a list of things that she was supposed to do for him, and how she hated it. It just made the hackles rise every time she looked at that list, which was continually being poked in front of her face. And then one day she laid that list down on the judge's bench and she was granted a divorce. Years went by, 
and she married again. And this marriage was as happy as the other had been unhappy. And then one day, shuffling through her things, she came across, sure enough, that old list. She had saved that. It still made her burn a bit, but she took it out, and she began reading down that list. Rise, 6 a.m., she did that. Build a fire, she always built the fires, got it started in the morning. Get my breakfast, she made breakfast every morning for her new husband. And lo and behold, she was doing virtually every single thing on that list and more, and loving every moment because she loved the man for whom she did it. I delight to do thy will, O oh my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. If your Christian experience has not been as vibrant, as alive, as enthusiastic, as enjoyable as you really want it to be, maybe now's the time to take a turn. Switch the emphasis in your life from behavior to relationship. Because don't you see, the true, the happy Christian is the one who has found not only something to believe in, but someone to love. Our dear loving Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the testimony of David today. I delight to do thy will, O oh my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Lord, each of us want that experience today. We're so thankful that we serve a God who accepts us just the way we are. There's no one in this congregation today who needs to leave here with any burden of guilt or sin on his heart today. Because whatever problems we bring to church today, we know that you are able to forgive to the uttermost. And Lord, I pray that no one will leave this place today until they have received that forgiveness and leave here with a clean slate. We're so thankful that you accept us just the way we are. And that all of us can leave here with a record whiter than snow. But Lord, as we go through our lives, we see the sin in our lives. And it makes us want to have that sin out of our lives. And Lord, we struggle and we, we look at the sins of our lives and we try so hard to stamp out the sin in our lives and try to gain the victory over that sin. And then we move on to another sin and we try in our own efforts and we try so hard because we want the victory over that sin. And my prayer today is instead of doing that, that we will turn our eyes upon Jesus. That we will look full in his wonderful face. That the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. Thank you, Jesus, for your amazing grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.